What's up? What's up? What's up? Where have y'all been? No. Hey, listen, I owe you guys an apology. Um, I've been out of the country um, for the last two weeks and um, my bad. I forgot to put a post up before I left that I was going to be gone and that there would be no show for the, for the past two weeks. Um, but hey, I'm going to make it up to you today because it's Talk To Him Tuesday. We ain't got no guests. It's just me and you talking to birds. What's going on with the Eagles, um, the expectations? There is a lot of buzz going on around our Philadelphia Eagles right now. And there's a lot of stuff going on around the league. My goodness, Deshaun Watson. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of expectations and a lot of hope for this 2022 season for the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, I don't know how you guys feel about it. Um, but I like to tread a little cautiously, um, you know, when, when talking about expectations early in the year, Showtime wants to know where I went. I was actually in Scotland. I went to Scotland to play golf. You guys know that I'm a, a golfer holly. Um, and I got invited to Scotland to play in the member guest and, uh, went over there and had a blast. Um, so that's where I was, but I, but I, I, I digress. Um, I think us as Philadelphia Eagles fans, you know, we've we've seen this picture before and what it looks like from the standpoint of um, you guys remember Dream Team. Um, I think the Eagles probably need to pump their brakes a little bit and not so much them. I, it's the outside commentary that goes on. And sometimes that can filter into the team. But I'm hoping that the leaders on this team, the head coach on this team, the organization cautions these guys about, you know, tempering their expectations and not tempering their expectations about what they should achieve, but they're tempering their expectations with regards to how the outside world, you know, is talking about them. Um, you know, old coach of mine used to say, you know, the thing about when people pat you on the back, you got to be careful. You got to keep your back to the wall. Because a lot of times when they pat you on their back, they're looking for a sharp, for a soft place where they can stick the knife. And, um, you know, I just think the Eagles are in that situation right now. You got every, the, the gurus and the pundits on, on ESPN, you know, on NFL Network. Everywhere you look, you know, everybody's projecting that the Eagles are going to win um, the NFC East division. And listen, there's nothing wrong with that. But you can't get caught up you know, reading your press clippings, um, you know, you still got to put the work in, you still got to do what's necessary to get yourself ready uh, for the season. Because even though they got one of the easiest schedules in the, uh, in the league, that doesn't mean that the season is going to be easy. They got to get ready, you know, to play this thing out. All the excitement about around what's going on, you know, the OTAs just wrapped up last week. Um, you know, the Eagles, I believe, are one of the first teams to finish up their OTAs and they finished up finished them up early and the article I was reading was you know they're looking at trying to lighten up their workload a little bit to get themselves ready for the season now okay so you work if you lighten up your workload and I get it you know a lot of these guys have been in Philadelphia at the complex lifting working out together hey listen kudos I love it okay but there's a major difference between football in the weight room walkthroughs in the off season and football come September. Um, so if you're going to pull back a little bit as far as, you know, the spring and the OTAs and all that kind of stuff is concerned, I'm just curious what in the world, um, you know, training camp is going to look like, you know, because to me, I felt like they had a pretty light training camp last year. And, and, and in my opinion, it kind of set them up 
you know, for a slow start. You know, Nick Sirianni was talking about, um, you know, the the uh, the joint practice. They're going to have a joint practice, you know, with um, I, I forget who it is, but I know that um, they're going to have a joint practice with someone again this summer. Um, are we to believe that that's what it's going to, you know, we're going to get the same thing we got last year that, hey, you know, we had four joint practices and every practice was, you know, darn there, you know, like a game. Um, at some point in time, you got to put the work in. Um, you got to put the work in on the field. Um, so I'm just curious to see how all of this is going to play out um, and, you know, how this team is going to get prepared and get ready, um, you know, for the upcoming season. Um, as you guys know, it is a Talk To Him Tuesday, so you guys can start firing questions right here. Um, all you like is just me and you today. You know, my man, David Crane, listen, man, I, I appreciate you guys uh, being here every time that I'm on air. Um, tell your friends about it. Um, hit that like button, please. Um, subscribe um, to the YouTube channel. And um, next week, I got some exciting news for you guys um, about the future of the Seth Joyner show and some of the things I got planned for you guys. Um, but David wants to know, um, you know, well, he doesn't want to know. He made a statement. He said it would be great to see Hargrave and Jordan Davis on the line together. My man, what did you forget about Fletcher Cox? Um, you know, Javon Hargrave was a recipient of a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one situations last year, got out to a great start, and then just kind of, you know, stalled out towards the end of the season. Um I don't know. I, I'm not one to believe that Fletcher Cox is just done. Um, you know, he had a down year last year. I think sometimes that can happen. Uh, playing in a new system, trying to figure it out, trying to figure out what you can and what you cannot do. And there were some times last year where Fletcher, you know, wasn't happy with how he was being asked to play. And then, you know, you guys have heard me talk about this a lot, you know, where, you know, if you put Fletcher in the three technique, and, and you you move the opposite tackle, he's in a two. Well, that center can turn to Fletcher all day long and um, and really pick him up and get him double. That's 700 pounds, you know, on 300 pounds. Sooner or later, that's going to wear you out. Um, but one of the things that I give Nick Sirianni a little bit of, well, not Nick Sirianni, but Jonathan Gannon a little bit and Tracy Rock a little bit of credit for last year is they started shifting Javon Hargrave down into, you know, a one or a two eye. Now, when you do that, that's basically moving the opposite tackle from Fletcher in between the guard and the center. Well, that center has got to honor the fact that he's in that a gap and he's at least got to get a hand on him, which now takes away some of the, some of the double teams on Fletcher's side, or at least delays it a little bit. Um, and there have been times, there were times last year, essentially where the center turned anyway. And because Javon Hargrave was on the inside shoulder, um, he had a direct path, you know, to the backfield. Um, as far as Jordan Davis is concerned, you know, listen, I like what I'm hearing. I hear that, you know, he's trying to get his weight down. He's trying to get down to about 330, um, you know, and that's going well. I'm glad that, you know, his mindset is there because, um, you know, you guys have heard me talk about it post-draft. You know, I really would like to see him down, you know, at 320. Um, because can you imagine, you know, the way that he can move if he could get down to that weight and maintain that? He's still going to have the mass. He's still going to have the power. He's still going to have the strength. But, you know, for the most part, he's a baby. Um, and what you want to do is begin to work on your pro body and get him in a place where he's light on his feet. Um, you know, he can you know do what he needs to do, do what he wants to do. Um, because, you know, you got heard, heard me talk about it before as well. You know, if he can only play on first and second down because he can't get a push or he can't get a rush, um, that's a high price to pay at 13 to move from 15 to 13 um, to pick up a guy that's a two down, a two down player um, and give up, you know, a, a fifth, a fourth and two fifths. Um, so I like what I'm hearing out of him. Um, but let's let's see where it goes. Let's see where it goes. Let me see what other questions I've got here. Um, do, 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 um, <laughs> come on, Tom, you're wrong for that. 
Tom Tom Kim said Fletcher who? Come on, man. Fletcher Cox, the five-time all-pro Philadelphia Eagle defensive tackle. Um now this is interesting. Eric Gallagher wants to talk about, you know, one Devin Allen. Um he's you know, you say you're hoping that he can he can catch the ball. Um listen, for y'all who don't know, um Devin Allen um you know is a hundred meter hurdler and ran the third fastest time in the history of of the event over this past weekend um he pretty much gave up his football career at oregon um to dive into the track and field um scene went to the olympics a couple of times didn't really um that didn't really pan out the way that he really expected or wanted it to um, but sometimes life is that way. So now he's, you know, throwing his cleats back on, getting back on the football field. Um, it'll be interesting to see if he can make the transition back and how long it takes him to make the transition back. Um, listen, I already got it down in, in, my, in my notes right here. You know, I'm excited about the speed, the off, the speed on the offensive side of the ball. Um, I'm excited about, you know, what this offense is going to look like, you know, when you think about this re receiving core. But there's a lot of players. Um, there's a lot of wide receivers. The Eagles again go to training camp, you know, with a boatload of wide receivers again, um, which is good because what you're doing is you're heightening the um, you know, the level of competition based upon how many guys you actually have in training camp. Um, oftentimes you'll see guys just disappear um because the training because the competition is just so so stiff. Um but you think about Devin, Devin Allen's speed, you think about Quez Watkins' speed, you think about, you know, the underneath ability of A.J. Brown and his ability, you know, to block because now you've got a wide receiver with some girth and some size on him that, you know, when you want to run those bubble screens out there, is not afraid to stick his, stick his nose in there and, and get a block. Um, got to be excited about what you see, but, you know, we'll find out real quick once training camp opens um you know eric you know what exactly um devin allen can bring to the table and for that matter what he's got left um you know in the tank um let me see i got a facebook user here he don't want to tell me what his name is but that's all good he wants to know how many yards do i think um smith i'm assuming that's Devontae smith going into his second year out of the university of alabama the former heisman trophy winner how many yards i think you'll have listen i think the eagles have weapons all over the place um and teams defense is going to have to make a decision on who it is that they want to double and who they want to take away um you know i think as a developing wide receiver that a guy like uh, Devontae Smith is not going to really see a whole lot of, um, you know, double teams unless he comes into the season early and he's just tearing it up. The guy that you expect to really get doubled is, you know, A.J. Brown. Um, you expect to see him get doubled, which means that things are going to open up for Quez Watkins and his speed down the field. It's going to open up opportunities for uh, Dallas Goddard. Um and if teams so desire to, you know, take Dallas Goddard away, because in my opinion, I think Dallas Goddard is one of the top five tight ends, if not three tight ends in the NFL right now. I probably stay with five because I think Kelsey Kittle and Waller are probably the top three at this point in time. But you know, he's on he's on on the precipice of you know being a top three guy. Um, but I think his skill set and their ability to get creative and figure out ways to get him the ball. He's the type of tight end that needs about seven to 10 targets a game. Then you start thinking about the targets and how you're going to disperse those targets. Um, you know, who's getting, who's getting doubled. Um, you know, Jalen hurts, you know, making the right reads and making the right checks to get off a guy that's doubled. That he can see pre-snap and get to, you know, another read. Um, all of those things will come in to focus. So Facebook user, um, I can't really tell for sure. I mean, one would think, you know, as a number 10 overall draft pick and as good a season as he had last year, that he'd probably be ready to break out this year. 
but there's always other factors that go into you know whether a guy can break out and 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 have a a, a thousand yard season. I clearly expect from him you know to be m- more productive than he was last year. We just don't know how. Okay, um, let me see. Come on, Ben. Why are you trying to get all up on my schedule, man? Um, you coming to golf in Philly this week? Um, absolutely. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, Tom Kim again. Tom wants to know um, how impactful will BG's return be? I think he can play at a high level. It'll make um, it easier for everyone else. And hey, listen, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, not only did you lose the production of BG on the field last year, but you lost the um, the leadership of BG on the field last year. Um, I saw him a couple of weeks ago at Brian Dawkins golf tournament. Um, you know, we chatted in past and I asked him, you know, how he was feeling, how he was doing. He said he's feeling great, ran to go. Um, and you know, the funny thing about an injury like that, if he can come back from the, from the injury itself and he can, you know, not only get over the physical hurdle and I always talk about this, you know, in football, when they, when you have an injury, there is a physical hurdle and there's a mental hurdle. And, you know, to most people's surprise, most people's surprise, um, I believe that the physical hurdle is easier to get over than the mental because you can work day in and day out, you know, to get he- your body's going to heal up. Um, I had six surgeries, you know, in my 13 years of playing in the NFL. They were all in the offseason except for one. And um, I healed up in time enough to be ready for training camp. Um, so guys are going to be healed. You guys, a guy like BG can be healed up, but when you get out on the field um, and you're leaning up against a 300 plus pound, you know, right tackle, um, when you take that first hit, um, even now running around, he's probably fine, but there's this psychological hurdle that you got to get over um, from a physical standpoint it's going to be the difference. And, you know, to your point, if he can get over that hurdle early, um, you know, when a guy misses time, like he missed time, you know, he's not only healing, you know, the Achilles that he ruptured, but the rest of his body is healing in a way where he's basically had, you know, two off seasons to heal up some things that might've been bothering him along the way. Um, So I expect for him to come back fresh in shape, ready to go. He looked good. Um, was in great spirits as always, and um, he's going to be a big piece of this defense, you know, and its and its success. And I know, you know, if there's any anybody that's chomping at the bit to get back on the field and prove that he's still got something left in the tank, that is one Brandon Graham. All right. Um, interesting question. This might be the question of the day so far. How is DC Gannon going to use Hassan Reddick? Listen, there's been a whole lot of speculation. People are talking about, you know, the versatility, you know, some different things that um, Jonathan Gannon has planned and what he can do. What I do know is that, you know, we kind of heard some of that rhetoric going into training camp last year when we saw how, how basically how vanilla they were um, during training camp and then during the last year's three preseason games. Um, the comment was made, you know, from Jonathan Gannon that, hey, you know, we're in a unique position as the first year staff is that, you know, we have the ability to go into week one um, with teams guessing what it is that, you know, we, we may bring to the table. So, you know, we're not going to not going to show our hand. We're not going to tell everybody exactly what it is, you know, that we're doing. Um, and then they got into the season. And they were just as vanilla during the regular season, in my opinion, as they were, um, you know, in the preseason. You know, we had the fiasco where, you know, someone asked Jonathan Gannon about dime. And he said, oh, you know, we're not a dime football team. And then as I was studying film two or three weeks later, guess what I found? A dime package. You know, I think I actually posted it here on the show. Um, You know, the, the crazy part is that, you know, if you're not a dime team, it's one thing to not be a dime team. I don't think you can survive in the NFL in today's offenses, you know, without a dime package. But the audacity to tell the other 31 teams in the league that you don't run dime. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, you know, really made him put in a dime package because they began to dictate um, defenses and personnel 
on the fact that they weren't going to put dime on the field. Um, but when you talk about, you know, how he's going to use Hassan Reddick, all we can do is kind of speculate. Listen, we saw last year that, you know, Gannon likes to run the five man fronts. He likes to mix it up. Um, I think you're going to see Hassan Reddick in that role that Jannard Avery played last year. Um, and Jannard Avery could give you something in the running game. He could give you a little bit of something in, in the pass rush, but he was quite frankly, both he and um, um, I'm trying to remember the kid from um, from the Washington football team that they brought in. His name will come to me in a sec, or one of you guys will remind me here. Um, but they brought him in last year, and then the five man and the five man looks. Those guys just got you know just decimated um, in the run game and the pass game. Um, but what you have in Hassan Reddick is a lot of versatility because you know the the Cardinals brought it, it drafted him, you know. And they out of Temple and they brought him in and they tried to play him as an off the ball linebacker. That didn't work too good, but there was a lot of skill sets during that process that he learned that he has now added to, you know, his, his package because those two years in Carolina um, or that year, last year in Carolina, you know, with the double digit sacks, there's some times where you see him dropping in coverage um, in, in zone concepts and in man concepts um, and, and really getting the job done. So that gives Jonathan Gannon a lot of versatility. You know, you can you can start off in a five man line, and you can shift to a four and move Hassan Reddick off the ball and blitz him from off the ball. Um, you know, you can drop him in the coverage. You can pull him off the line. You can shift the line to him. There's a whole plethora of different things um, from a creativity standpoint that Jonathan Gannon can do with a player like Hassan Reddick and all his versatility. Now. He's going to have to wait and see the cre the creativity um, that I'm talking about and the creativity that um, some people in the in the uh, in the news writing um, sector are talking about. Um, I'll be curious to see. All right. Um, before I take another question, um, I want to talk about I want to give Nick Sirianni some some kudos. Um, as you guys know, um, Nick has given up the play calling duties to Shane Steichen this year. And um, I guess the question was posed to him in a press conference, why? Um, and his response was, and I respect the hell out of this. His response was, um, you know, sometimes guys get caught up, you know, on eagle trips. Um, you come from another place and you're an offensive coordinator and the thing that you want to do is you want to call plays because that's what you that's what you're used to. You want to call plays because you know you're the head guy and you have complete autonomy to call whatever you want to call, how you want to call it. Um, and, and I think you guys can go back and, and recall in the um, you know in his first press conference when the Eagles introduced him as the new head coach. Um, some someone in the media asked him whether he'd be calling plays, and his his answer was absolutely. Um, that's what I do. That's what I love to do. And, you know, I'm not giving up those duties. And after his first year, he's now giving up the play calling duties to Shane Steichen. He says that Shane Steichen has done a great job and deserves this opportunity. Um, he said, but also it's the ego situation that, you know, I'm big enough to get my ego out of the way to step aside and let someone else do it. And what that does is that allow, that frees me up and allows me to be, um, a better head coach um and, and for you know if you don't have in my opinion if you don't have a special teams coordinator and i'm not saying that the eagles don't i got my reservations about um about jonathan gannon and his style of play calling on the defensive side of the ball um special teams wise i think the philadelphia eagles were probably middle of the pack last year um but what giving up the play calling does for nick sirianni is it gives him an opportunity to kind of step back and be and and be on top of everything. You know, um, when you're calling plays, you know, you got to be calling plays two or three plays ahead. Um, you got to be on the sideline, even when the defense is on the field or the special team is on the field. You got to be thinking about, you know, how you're coordinating plays and how you're going to call them the next time that you have offensive possession. But when you're a head coach that's not calling plays, um, that allows you to have conversations with your defensive coordinators. It allows you to be more engaged with players 
on the individual basis as they come off the field um, and, and talking to them about different situations and circumstances that may occur on the field during plays. Um, it allows him to go over and have conversations, you know, with the special teams coach. You know, hey, the special team coach may see something in film, you know, leading up that week, and they may practice something. But a lot of times, you know, there's not enough time, to, you know, between, you know, going in, into fourth down situations and getting the offense off the field and the special teams on the field for the head coach and the special teams actually special team coach to actually have that conversation about, hey, you know, we got this trick play. You know, what do you think about it? Um, so this really frees Nick Sirianni up, um, you know, in his words, quote, unquote, to be a better head coach for the entire team. All right. All right. So let's jump back into these questions here. Um, uh, all right. Tony. Tony. um Tony's trying to be rational here, but, you know, I, I will, in answering this question, I will ask you, do you move up from 15 to 13 um, and give up, I believe it's, you know, a fourth and two fifth round picks in order to get a guy that's just only going to be, you know, a two down um, defensive lineman. That's a steep price to pay. Tony's question is if Jordan Davis is, is effective at stopping the run, um, leaving the other team in third and longs, um, do you need Davis to be a great pass rusher, I would say absolutely. You know, it you got to understand why this move was made. First of all, they moved up to 13 to keep the Baltimore, Baltimore Ravens from drafting him. You know, they're looking for the heir apparent in Baltimore to Calais Campbell. Calais Campbell signs a one year, you know, um, deal to come back. Fletcher Cox is no different. You know, you got to start thinking about the future because when it comes to important players, um, like a Fletcher Cox, a, a Javon Hargrave, a Milton Williams. You know, you see these guys being drafted, you know, in the earlier rounds. You see, you know, Jordan Davis being drafted. You know, not only do you need depth, but you better be thinking about youth. I think, you know, Fletcher Cox is 10 plus years in. Um, you just never know. When you looked at how he played last year, um, everyone wondered out loud whether he had lost a step whether, you know, he was, you know, getting old. Um, as an organization, as a GM, it, you, you have to look at that and you've got to plan for that. Because, I mean, basically, this defense is predicated on this defensive line. When you draft, um, when you when you re-sign um, Fletcher Cox, you got Javon Hargrave in the fold. You got Milton Williams in the fold. Okay, you're getting BG back. Um, Josh Sweat, you know, um, seven and a half sacks last year, kind of proving that, you know, he's a guy that can be a player. You turn around and you um, you turn around and you bring in, you bring Derek Barnett back. Um, when you look at all of these moves and you look at how this defense is constructed, this is a defensive line centric defense. This defense is going to rely on the defensive line to get it done, um, so a rush, uh, so so a a move like this has to be made because you got to be thinking long term. You got to be thinking down the road. You got to be thinking, what if Javon Hargrave gets hurt? What if Fletcher Cox gets hurt? Um, you know, you're at a major deficit if you lose any one of those guys for an extended period of time. Um, but to my point, if Jordan Davis is going to be the heir apparent at defensive tackle for the Philadelphia Eagles. Yes, he needs to be a great um, pass rusher when you consider where they drafted him and, um, and and what they gave up to move up to get him, okay? All right. Um, let me see. What do we got here? Um, uh, You guys are funny, man. I'm looking at some of these comments. We need a head coach, not a glorified, <laughs> not a glorified play caller. Um, all right. So Miles Sanders is popping up on here quite a bit. We're going to do two miles in a row. So Kyle wants to know, um, Miles Sanders said, you know, he's taking this year personal. It seems like there's more to this. Um, 
you know, I guess that says I don't know he's the wince of running backs on Philly. Your thoughts? Oh, no, um, listen, I, I think that, you know, Miles has got to figure out a way to keep himself healthy. I think there's nothing more that the Eagles want. Oh, that was um, um, Kerrigan. Um, that was the defensive end last year they brought in from the Washington football team. Um, Nelson, thanks, man. Um, Miles has got to figure out how to keep himself healthy. There's just no getting around it. Um, I think that they want him to be the guy, um, but I also believe that, you know, the Eagles um, have a, a standard, you know, for how they deal with their running backs. You know, you don't see the Eagles running backs very often get, you know, more than 16 carries in a game. I think there is a um, – I think that there is a data analytics metric that says that, you know, once a running back exceeds 16 carries – that the um, propensity for injury goes up significantly. So the Eagles have tried to, you know, in my in my opinion, they've tried to figure out a way to keep him healthy. They minimize his number of carries, you know, but the truth of the matter is, you know, when, when you're the guy and you're carrying the ball as much as a running back is going to carry it, um, it's a different thing when a tight end or wide receiver catches the ball down the field and he's being pursued by a defensive back or a linebacker. Um, a running back is taking punishment from all 12 guys. Um, a wide receiver or a tight end who catches the ball down the field, he may only have to deal with, you know, seven to six guys downfield. Um, so it's different. So the workload needs to be different. Um, you know, and, and to be honest with you, that's not going to change. He's going to have to try to figure out, you know, through his training – you know, how to get it done. I mean, you've seen a guy like Saquon Barkley struggle the last two years with injuries. Um, and I don't think there's a, a another running back besides Derrick Henry who got injured last year, um, you know, who's more fit. Um, so it, the best that Miles can do is to kind of try to figure out, you know, how to keep himself healthy. Now, you know, this I'm taking it personal this year. Um, I think that Miles, you know, wants to be the guy. I think he wants to be here. I think he knows that his contract is up soon and, you know, he wants to get paid and he wants to stay and be here in Philly. Um, but I think he also knows that if he can't stay healthy and he can't be that guy that the Eagles really drafted him to be, um, that, you know, the way that the league looks at running backs and the way that the league, you know, looks at linebackers now, um, that it's going to be, one of those situations where, you know, the Eagles are going to look in the draft and, and, and try to find his replacement. Um, there's all, already a whole bunch of talk about the fact that, um, um, gosh, I've been so long removed. I can't remember guys' names right now. Um, it's the, the young running back that the Eagles just drafted last year. Um, anyhow, his name will come to me in a sec. But there's a lot of chatter that um, – you know, that he may be the guy moving forward. Um, and I, I would just say, I would just say this, that I, I think that, um, you know, the young kid last year, Kenneth Gainwell, thank you guys. I think he, his problem was he couldn't protect. Um, and teams figured that out fairly quickly. And once they figured out um, that, he couldn't protect. Then they came up with ways to actually keep him in the backfield um, in situations where, um, you know, in third down, and he was the the last guy, you know, left in the backfield. Now, I, can the Eagles help him? Absolutely. I think you know if you go twenty personnel, that's you know two backs um, and three wide receivers. Now you can begin to tap into um, the versatility of Kenneth Gainwell. Now, does he, he, does he still need to be solid in protection and understand and learn protections? Absolutely. I mean, he put Jalen Hurts in some awful situations and awful spots, um, you know, last season. But you kind of expect that from a young guy, you know, who really doesn't understand and know the complexities, 
you know, of, of protections up front and how and where he fits into that. Um, but the Eagles could help him, in my in my opinion. You know, you go to some twelve, some twenty personnel. Um, I think that that gives you the ability to create matchups. You know, a lot of teams might not necessarily go dime in that situation. They may go nickel, and then that puts you in a situation where you can actually, you know, create one-on-one situations. Um, you can you can motion him out of the backfield. Um, you can hand him the ball and let him run and let Miles be, you know, the blocking back. Or, you know, you could have done that, you know, with Jordan Howard last year. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you could have protected him that the Eagles really didn't. They just they felt like at some point in time um, that he would understand what he was supposed to be doing and be able to get it done. Um, and unfortunately for him, um, he couldn't. And I thought – I. I, that was the primary reason, in my opinion, why, um, you know, why he did not see a lot of playing time during the second half of the season. All right. Um, my man, David Crane, once got a Miles, a Miles question. Does Miles Sanders have a breakout year since the receiving corps has improved? Well, listen, it, it, there's a point to that. But, you know, all of this stuff kind of goes hand in hand. Um I think that their ability to throw the football is going to have a lot to do with their ability to run the football. Um, but their ability to run the football, to your point, is going to have a lot to do with their ability, you know, to be able to throw it as well. You know, um, this is a critical year, you know, for this offense. It's a critical year for Jalen Hurts um, because I don't think that you can hide him this year um, like you did last year via the run and wait for him to develop. I think if you're trying to find out whether he's the guy or not, I think that Jalen Hurts has got to throw the ball, you know, 30 to 35 times a game. Um, you know, there were some times, you know, last year, you know, where he barely, you know, got above, you know, 12 to 15 passes in a game because we were just running the ball, you know, so efficiently. Um, a lot of people will say, well, if that's what it takes to win, then what's wrong with doing that? And you guys know that I'm, I'm the I'm the guy waving the flag, waving the run the damn football flag. But I also believe that if you got to find out whether he can be the guy or not, then that means that he's going to have to prove that he can throw the ball efficiently 30 to 35 times a game and raise his completion percentage up, you know, to at least, you know, 60, 63 to 67 percent. I mean, that's where you really need to be as a professional quarterback in this league um, to be operational. So listen, I, I think Miles knows that, you know, the time, the clock is ticking David um, on his time in Philly. If he doesn't produce, he also knows that, you know, he's rolling into, you know, an opportunity for a contract. Um, and I think he was extremely frustrated last year that, you know, he has some production, has some injuries, but spent the entire year, running the football and did not have one single rushing touchdown all year. As a matter of fact, the rookie Kenneth Gainwell, um, I believe led the Eagles in rushing touchdowns. Um, so I'm sure he felt some type of way about that. No doubt about it. Um, I want to address this. Um, one is asking the question, you know, have you heard anything about the birds moving? Um, to a bare front or a three, four front. Okay, so let me let me put this to rest for you guys. Okay. The way that offenses are structured nowadays, um, you know, for the most part, you are a four-two front. Now, you can get into some five-man looks. Um, you know, you can do you can get in some eagle bear looks where you got two edge rushes out wide, seven to eight wide. Um, and, you know, you cover up the three interior guys with, two, with three big defensive tackles. Um, you know, you can even make it look like at times uh, that you're in a 30 front. You know, they're going to look like at times, you know, when you get Hassan Reddick on the field, um, it's going to look like they're in a 30 front. Um but no one's truly running the 30 front. I mean, they may have it in their package, but they're not running it 
you know, on a series by series basis, um, just because um, when you go five man line, the weakness to the five man line is you lose one guy in coverage. Um, you know, when you're four, when you're four down, no matter how you make it look, um, that means that you've got that extra guy in coverage. Um, so to, to me, you know, I hear a lot of, oh, you know, four, three, three, four, um, you know, all of these, listen, you, you, you're pretty much, you defenses, offenses are going to dictate the defenses, you know, what kind of personnel you can put on the field. Um, you know, if, if you're going to go two tight ends, yeah, you may be able to get away with some three, four look. You may get away with some four, three look. Um, you know, if, if you go, you know, 13 personnel, um, where you just, you go one back and three tight ends, you want to go heavy. Yeah. You're going to get some different looks. You're going to get some traditional looks. You, you may even, and I haven't seen this in a while. I don't understand why teams don't do it. Um, we used to have a package, you know, our extra backer package, you know, where you actually would take a corner out and insert an extra linebacker in the game when teams would go to these three, these heavy three and four tight end sets. Um, you see a lot of teams that just, you know, they, they trot out there, you know, regular base personnel. And quite frankly, you know, you don't have enough bodies across the front in base personnel to handle three and four tight end sets. That's just, you know, that, that's just the truth about it. So, you know, when, when people are talking about this 34 front, you know, you're talking about a guy like Hassan Reddit that's pretty much lined up in a five man in a five man look and he's lined up on the weak side and BG's going to stand up on the strong side. Okay. And then you got three down in the middle. Um, so it's a 30 look, but you don't necessarily have four linebackers in the game. That means you got three down guys, but you know, what you're doing is you're dropping a safety in the box, which gives you the fourth linebacker. Um, but you don't see a whole lot of that. To me, that's changeup stuff. Teams don't live in that all the time because it's a it's a um, it's a passing game deficiency. And good coordinators, you know, will eat that a lot. They will force the matchups that they want. All right. Um, let's see what else we got working here. Um, Um, all right, let's talk to Jalen Hurts. Um, my man Sky says, I'm fine with second call in place. I do hope that Hurts can be given the keys to be that leader on the field as well. Listen, there's a lot of chatter going on um, about the ascension of Jalen Hurts. Um, you guys know how I feel about the situation. I've told you guys time and time again. Um, I never talk about what a guy can't do or what he can do until I see him actually prove what he can or what he can't do. Um, just because if that mentality would have been taken with me as an eighth round draft pick, then I would have never made it in the NFL. There were certainly plenty of people from coaches, you know, my college coaches and even, you know, some of the pro coaches that actually coached me, um, made the statement that they didn't think I had what it took. Um, but Buddy Ryan gave me an opportunity to prove to myself, to prove to them um, that I could be the guy. Well, listen, Jalen Hurts is in the same situation. The only difference with Jalen Hurts and why people are so up in arms about Jalen Hurts is, is, you know, how he got here under the pretenses that he got here, um, how he played last year as the full-time starter, you know, was real sketchy. And, you know, there were times we did some great things. There were some times, you know, expectedly, you know, where he made you wonder, could he be the guy? Um, but I always say that, you know, most football players, most professional football players, it takes them three years to kind of get their footing and figure it out, especially a quarterback. You know, Jalen Hurts is going to have the, the um, you know, the fortune finally being in the same offensive system, um, you know, two years in a row. I mean, this kid for the last six years has been, you go back to his college years, he's played in a different system every single year. Um, so now he has the ability to step into a system that will allow him some familiarity 
Um, and listen, he's putting in the work in the off season. Um, he's out there in California, you know, with house working on his mechanics. Um, you know, I've, I've heard that he's kind of trailing Tom, Tom Brady trying to decipher and, and, and get some of that greatness to rub off, off of him. He's willing to put in the work. He's willing to put in the time and the effort to be, um, to be a great quarterback. So I'm just going to step back and give him the opportunity and the benefit of the doubt to get it done. You know, I'm not going to be one of those guys that's a naysayer, you know, and, and I'm not saying that you are. I'm just saying, you know, you say you hope that he can be. I hope so as well. And I hope that people can, you know, uh, be gracious enough to give him the opportunity to do it without, um, you know, crucifying the guy. Because, listen, he's going to make some mistakes. We all make we all made mistakes. And, you know, to me, those three and a half games this rookie year, those are just washes. That really, you know, that only thing that that provided was an opportunity for him to get a, get an opportunity to see how fast the game actually plays. Because, you know, you threw him out there with a with a handful of plays and, you know, Doug just had him out there running around. And it was pretty apparent, you know, after some of the things that we've heard that Doug really didn't want to put him out there. But it really wasn't his call. OK, so let's give the young kid a chance. He's got all the weapons that he needs. Um, he's putting in the work. Nick Sirianni likes what he sees, according to his comments um, during OTAs. Let's let the season, let's let things fold out and let's figure out, you know, what Jalen Hurts can be before, you know, we, um, before we extend the verdict. All right. Um, let's see. What else we got? Um, this is interesting with the with Brandon Brooks retiring um, Eric Gallagher wants to know who do I think gets the right guard position well you know you got Isaac Sayamalo who's coming off an of injury um, you know the Eagles second round draft pick um, you know obviously you know he's going to be the heir apparent at center, but we saw how that turned out, you know, with the heir apparent drafted at center last year, he's now entrenched on the left side at left guard. Um, so what I like to see, you know, is competition, you know, I, you know, Isaac Sayamalo is serviceable coming off, you know, a major injury. He's serviceable, but there's nothing like competition to help bring out, um, make the cream rise to the top in every situation. Um, and, and I would love to see um, a good, healthy competition at right guard, um, you know, with a, a plethora of different players um, for the job. Because you, know, you got the pressure of the competition, but once a guy is has won the position, that pressure still stays there because if he doesn't continue to play well as a starter, he knows that someone's, you know, right over – right over his shoulder and um and hopefully um you know we, we get the best out of that position because if you look across the board you know we still got a pretty damn elite offensive line um i was hoping that brandon graham was going and brandon brooks excuse me was going to come back you know for one more ride um but he decided to call it a career call it a day the injuries just became too insurmountable for him um and now you know we got to figure out how to fill that spot and you know I have no doubt whatsoever, none, that Jeff Stoutland will get the job done. All right. Um, let's see. Um, Tom, stop it, man. Tom wants to know would any of our linebackers be able to transition to safety? We need another safety and a punt return and a kick return. Now, listen, okay. Haven't you seen enough of these? experiments where we try to take a safety to in college, um, try to move him over, you know, to linebacker and take a linebacker in college and try to move him to safety. Um, for, for the first time, the Eagles got depth um, at the linebacker position. You know, you just draft N'Kobe Dean. You sign a free agent, Kazir White. Um, you know, you got TJ Edwards. You got um, – Davion Taylor, who I think, you know, can be a factor if he can figure out how to keep himself healthy. Um, you know, 
you drafted another linebacker, I believe, in the fifth or the sixth round. Um, can't recall his name. But for the first time, you got some depth at the linebacker position. Leave it alone. Let the competition begin. You don't name anybody as the starter. Just open it up day one and let these guys battle it out and let them make the best man win, the best two men, I should say. Because all of them are going to get an opportunity to play. You know how it is in the NFL now. It's not like when I played. You know, I wasn't coming out for nobody. I'm not, I wasn't giving up my reps for anybody. Um, and I'd be damned if I would, you know, even insinuate that I was tired because that meant extra hundreds the following week because you wasn't in shape. That's just the way Buddy Ryan was wired. Um, but I think, you know, that there's some, there's some moves to be made out there for the Eagles. And, and I think that, listen, Anthony Harris played well. They're, they're excited about um, – you know, Epps, um, before we try to, you know, shake things up and make a move, let's see how these guys do. You know, it'll be both of – well, it'll be, you know, Epps – well, it'll be both of these guys' second year in the system, so they should, you know, have a lot more, um, you know, um, they should be more productive, I should say, in a system that they're more familiar with. There should be a lot more communication between themselves and the corners and the linebackers. Um, which, you know, in, in my opinion, you know, it stems a lot of the tide. A lot of times, you know, when teams don't perform well on the defensive side of the ball and you look positionally why that's not happening, a lot of times it's a communication deal. You know, if I'm studying film all week, okay, and as a defensive player, I'm anticipating based upon down and distance, personnel on the field, um, all of these things, um, if I'm in man-to-man -man coverage, and I got the tight end on my side, I'm on the ball, and I got the back offset to my side. Okay, the first, the, the communication between me and Byron is, you know, it's a zebra call. That was our in and out. I'm going to try to force the tight end to him. Okay, he's going to pick up the tight end. I'm going to pick up the back when the back releases. Okay, if the tight end wants to arc release and get outside of me, Byron knows right now if he releases across my face that he's mine. Go get the back. But – we have that communication going on pre-snap. A lot of times, you know, um, you know, I've seen the Eagles last year where you got a DB running across the field and there's no communication. Or you got safeties that are in halves look and a guy and, and, a, and a wide receiver comes in motion from one side to the other and the opposite side safety rotates down. Well, whatever side – that guy comes to the safety on that side is supposed to rotate down. The other guy's supposed to rotate, you know, to the middle of the field. That's a communication ish issue. Okay. And when guys are communicating, that tells me they know what the hell they're doing when they don't talk. And then the play is made. And then you see the guy looking at the other guy, like, you know, why the hell you ain't see, that's just not good, smart football. Um, and that begins with coaching. Uh, if I'm coaching the defense, I better hear a whole lot of chatter in practice. The linebackers better be talking. They're a hybrid. They, be, they better make sure that my defensive linemen are lined up where they're supposed to be because when those guys get tired and they got to put their hand down on the ground, they got to come off the ball with that threesome every single play, they get locked, okay? They get locked, and they got their fingers in their ears, so to speak. So my, line, my, my linebackers got to be able to communicate and talk to my defensive linemen and make sure that they're where they're supposed to be on every single situation. And then the linebacker – at the other end of the spectrum, he got to have his eyes and his ears peeled for what's going on behind him. That safety better be talking to him. That's, those safeties better be talking to each other. And they better be talking to those corners outside so they know what the heck is going on. That's just good defense. That's a part of good defense. And when you see teams make mistakes and you see guys pointing at each other and guys looking back at each other, it's always it always is a an, an occurrence of a lack of communication. So no, I don't want to see us. I want to see us go get us a a, a a a bona fide punt return and kick return guy. And I think we may have one, a um, little jitterbug. Um, we we'll have to wait the training camp to see how all that plant pans out. But I don't want to see any more transition of you know linebackers to safeties and safety to linebackers. I had enough of that. All right. Um, let's see what else we got before time runs out. Um, Charles, I appreciate you, man. Um, we got 
you know, 79 viewers. We doubled that number and 21 likes. We're up to 29 likes. Guys, please like, please share, um, and subscribe to the channel. I appreciate you. All right. Let's see. Um, interesting. Okay. Sean wants to know, um, do I think with this year's defense, can someone step up and be the vocal leader of the defense? Um, I'm going to say Reddit or Dean fills that, that role. Well, Hey, listen, um, I think that, you know, I think guys can be leaders without being vocal. Um, if you're productive and you get it done week in and week out, game in and game out, um, then you're going to have guys that follow you and you're going to have a voice if, if you're a vocal guy. Um, I think Fletcher Cox is a leader, but he's not vocal. He just leads by example. I think the vocal leader you're going to get back is BG. Um, you know, anytime that you're a new guy, I can remember when I actually left the Eagles and came to the Cardinals. You know, listen, you got a hierarchy, you know, there. You already got guys who have been here, been there. You got guys who were, you know, already leaders on that football team. You just can't step into someone's house, you know, and start barking and, you know, acting like, you know, you're the lead dog. It takes time. You got to come in and prove to those guys that you can be just as productive as you were where you were. Um, with a guy like N'Kobe Dean, listen, he's got to prove, um, you know, that he can be that guy to pick up the pick up the defense and get guys lined up, you know, and be that leader. That takes proof. And the only way that you can prove that is by making plays and getting it done on the field because ain't nobody following the guy who's getting beat like a war drum. Not going to happen. You got to be a player and you better be making some plays if you're going to open your mouth and say something. If not, the only thing you're going to do is create a whole lot of dissension and factions on the defensive side of the ball because guys will be looking at each other. Man, he over there running his mouth. He just got his ass drove the last play. No, can't have that. If you're a leader, you know, you're going to lose some battles. That's just football. But you can't be that guy to get drove 10 yards down the field and then jump up talking about somebody else, miss the covers. No, don't work like that. All right? Um... Let's see what else we got here. I'm trying to get caught up. Um, um, Kyron Johnson from uh, from Kansas. That's the other linebackers that the Eagles drafted. Um, GT wants to know, um, by what game will you know if Jonathan Gannon game planning has changed? Um, I don't think it'll take that long. I think it'll be week one um, that we'll clearly understand um, whether the improvement um, personnel-wise, you know, was the reason why he was so conservative in vanilla last year. Um, because he certainly got it all. You got two cornerbacks now. Um, you know, you got a proven slot corner. Um, you might not be proven at the safety position, but the fact that you didn't make a move to upgrade the position um, tells me that, you know, not only is Howie, you know, um, comfortable, but Jonathan Gannon is comfortable with the players that they have there. Um, so turn it loose. I mean, it's not going to take long. I would say, um, you know, by game, by the third or fourth game, you know, if they're doing well, it's not going to be that much of an issue. But they struggle through the first couple of games. Obviously, you know, there's going to be some questions about, um, you know, whether Jonathan Gannon can be creative because there are no hindrances, to, you know, to what it is that he might want to call or what it is that he might want to do. All right. Hey, guys, it's been real hanging with you guys again. Um, I'm back, back in the saddle. I'm glad to be with you guys. Hey, listen, make sure that you uh, that you follow, um, that you're subscribing, that you're liking, tell everybody about the Seth Joyner Show. And um, I look forward to being with you guys next week. Uh, I've got a special announcement for you guys as well next week's show. As always, be good to each other, take care of each other. But most importantly, make sure that you love each other. Peace out.